Hi, everyone, and welcome to our very first EDU Learn AMA. AMA stands for Ask Me Anything, and that's just what we're here to do today. To get us started on this journey, I can't think of anyone better to get the ball rolling than a handful of my professors from my doc program, Jason and Scott. Jason Richardson and Scott McLeod are here to join us today, and we've got a couple questions for them on deeper learning. Why can they answer questions about deeper learning? Because in the past year, they published a book titled Leadership for Deeper Learning. And within this, they studied schools all around the states that um, were really looking at deeper learning and, and looked at the research into leadership behaviors and support structures that were happening in schools. So we've got a couple questions to get us started. To begin with, Jason, how do you think deeper learning will impact our schools in the long run? Well, I think deeper learning and, and, and leadership for deeper learning, it gives us a, a smorgasbord of options, if you will. Like it's not a cookie cutter of here is one model of schooling that gets you to deeper learning. There's lots of entries. There's lots of paths that schools and leaders can take to get to deeper learning. So I think it offers us opportunities and challenges, but good challenges, challenges to change specific contexts and specific options. Like not everyone needs to go to a graduate profile, but that might be your entry point into going to deeper learning. It might be PBL. There's all kinds of options that can get schools to start thinking about the student experience differently. What do you say to a school that says, we're already doing deeper learning. We've been doing this. We're masters at this already. Like this isn't something new. I would ask them to interrogate that a little bit further. It's great that you think you're there, but let's ask the students. Let's look at the student experience. Are the students having agency? Are they having more voice and choice? Who's running the curriculum? Who's setting up the scheduling? So things like that, start thinking about, are there ways that we can really start pushing this a little bit further? So a lot of schools, when they say they're doing deeper learning, I find they're doing an element of deeper learning, but mm -hmm. they're not necessarily all in. They might be all in to say, hey, yeah, we have a project-based learning that goes throughout the whole year. It's like, that's a great start, but now where can we go from there? Great. Scott, is there any particular school or leader that you think is really like doing something super awesome at this time? You know, I think one of the things we found, of course, working on the book is that different schools have different strengths. And so answering that question may depend on what you're looking for. Mm. Right? So in other words, a school that's doing really well, for example, on place-based or community embedded learning might be different from a school that's doing really well on complexity-based progressions, or might be different from a school that's doing really well at creating high levels of student agency within STEM pathways or whatever, right? So, you know, that's sort of a broad question to ask. I can say that probably the schools that speak to me the most right now, sort of as a group, are the cluster of schools associated with the Big Picture Learning Network because they have a very strong commitment to both really robust inquiry and project-based learning experiences for students that are richly connected to their communities, but they're also targeting students that traditionally have been marginalized within school systems. So rather than sort of throwing up their hands and saying that, quote, these kids, unquote, can't do this kind of learning work, they're really leaning into showing the world that those kids, however you want to label them, can do that work in really rich, robust, and powerful ways. And that's very inspiring. Fantastic. Jason, do you have anyone that you wanted to, unbelievable, that you'd seen that you'd like to chat about? Well, there's so many of them. But like what Scott said, it depends on what you're referring to, right? Yeah. Like if we're looking at schools that are doing really good with community engagement, you know, we have Iowa Big out there that's built all around externships and kids actually being out in the community or expeditionary learning schools like up in Casco Bay, where it's all about community driven, plus all about student experiences, trying to better their local environments, right? So it really all depends on what you want. And when we started the school, we actually sat down, Scott built out a building blocks of future ready schools years ago with these 10 building blocks. We started thinking about what schools are doing an amazing job around one-to-one -one computing or around alternative credentialing. And we started coming up with schools like that, but we started realizing when we think about deeper learning schools that they're not just doing one thing. They're usually doing a cluster of awesome things. So we couldn't just say this school is doing really great with equity because all the schools are doing great with equity. It's just a mm. different lens on how they were actually doing that. Or flexible scheduling. It might just look different in different schools. So we found that those building blocks were sort of a, a good catch-all for these types of schools, but they were all doing all 10 of them really well. Scott, did you want to add something down there? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that I would say is that I tend to have a soft spot in my heart for schools that really hand things over to kids Mm -hmm. in ways that most schools don't think are even possible, right? So we profiled a couple of schools in our book, like Altafiti in Christchurch, New Zealand, and One Stone in Boise, Idaho, right? That literally kids are driving their learning 100% of the time, basically every day, every week, every month, all school year. And it's wild right? Like, you know, there's not a teacher created curriculum. The kids are basically just showing up and being like, what do I want to learn for the next few weeks or months? And, and those places really stretch our thinking mm-hmm. about schools as institutions of learning and what kind of experiences we're trying to create for kids. You know, this is not like we're dabbling a little bit with a little genius hour over here or, you know, a little passion project or whatever. Like this is full blown, like kids just own this whole thing all year. And we just sit back and help facilitate and guide. And I have a soft spot for those places because kids are just blowing it out. Yeah, I visited School 21 in um, East London. And it was the same way, like the way the dialogue that the kids were having with each other was well above dialogue that you would hear in most other schools. The kids were running the, not that didn't bring the entire curriculum, they had coaches and teachers that really acted on the periphery where the kids were the ones who knew how to engage each other in honest, deep discussions. It was very powerful to sit in and listen to them navigate tough conversations. Like, should we defund the police? Let's have them actually break that apart and what that actually looks like, the pros and cons. It's so interesting to see them look at those kind of problems and see both sides and to be able to navigate that conversation themselves with the teachers just sitting there on the side going, good point, Scott. Yeah. Mike, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, no, I just had a question. If uh, Scott or Jason wanted to answer in your own words, if you could quickly define deeper learning, but also if you ever found a moment where you had a student-centric type of learning going on while you were in school. So Jason, with your permission, I'll take first shot at that. So traditionally, school curriculum has been dictated by schools themselves or by policy people. We create these long policy documents at the national level, you know, from the Ministry of Education or the state or whatever, or we adopt somebody's curriculum like the AP program or maybe IB, and they basically tell us what the curriculum should look like, right? And historically, many of those curricula have been relatively shallow, but very broad. So for example, one of the ongoing complaints in the States is that pick your grade level and pick your subject area, but the curriculum for that is usually you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. And there's this incredible pressure to cover everything by the end of the year so the kids will do well on whatever museum they have to take and so on, right? And so you know, the idea of deeper learning is that instead of us going broad, that we actually have fewer things that we say we want kids to acquire during their school experience, that those things might be academic content, but they might also be other competencies like, are you a good collaborator? Are you a good critical thinker? Can you use technology fluently? Are you an excellent speaker? And then sort of creating experiences in which kids can go really deep on those and really focus on mastery and depth of acquisition rather than shallowly skipping across the shallowest curriculum, like, you know, skimming a rock across the lake, right? And then hoping the kids hang on to stuff. So that's sort of the basic idea of deeper learning, right? I think, you know, in my own work with schools, talk about sort of four big ideas that are connected with deeper learning. One is the idea of cognitive complexity. How do we get beyond mere factual recall and procedural regurgitation to those upper level, richer, more robust thinking skills we want kids to exhibit? Other components of deeper learning environments would include high levels of student agency, we're probably working on real world authentic work. We're probably using technology in some really meaningful, robust ways. And those come together to create a very different kind of learning experience for kids. Jason, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, Scott does a real great job of encapsulating what that looks like and what that feels like. I sort of look at deeper learning like you know it when you see it. You're like, oh yeah, here it is. This is it. You can tell a deeper learning experience from a deeper learning school. It just makes sense. Like walking into one stone, you can just tell that it looks and feels and acts different than a school that's just doing PBL, you know, for an hour a, year, a day. It's like, yeah, that, that lesson is cognitively complex. Those students have agency during that hour. And this is all deeper learning stuff, but it's not necessarily spread out to the whole school. 
versus some schools that are all built around this idea of deeper learning. Some of the schools that Scott pointed out in the big picture learning network, expeditionary learning networks, they just feel different. I don't know, the depth is just going through everything that they're doing versus one-off activities. Yeah, I mean, and I think Jason is right. You can really feel the vibe. It's very palpable when you walk into one of these schools, right? So you see kids who are really driving their own learning as opposed to being so teacher-directed or system-directed. They're working on really meaningful, relevant stuff that's connected to the real world. Mm -hmm. You're thinking in much more complex ways about that work than we typically ask kids to do, like when we ask them to fill out a worksheet or do an exam or you know, write a quick essay. And together, that aggregate effect, you could usually walk out wishing that your kid went there <laughs> yeah. um, because the work that's happening there is so robust and amazing. Mike, for the second part of your questions, I think about my own upbringing as a student. I'm old, so I went to school a long time ago. And I can't really think of a lot of experiences that I had in school where I had the chance to do that kind of robust learning that we're trying to profile now. I was very good at playing the game in school. I was good at giving teachers what they asked for. I got good grades, but I wouldn't say that, you know, sort of my, my cognitive load was robust and rich. I wouldn't say that I had a chance to direct my own learning very often, other than in sort of very superficial ways where the teacher threw out a few breadcrumbs for us to, to gnaw on, but otherwise it was very, still very tightly scaffolded and structured. Okay, thank you for sharing. And you, Jason? And yeah, just to, I'm thinking about my experience when we visited STEM Chattanooga. So there, the school leader, Tony Donan, just said, hey, you don't want to talk to me. Here's the kid. So the kids gave the school tour. They talk about what, school, student, what learning is like for them versus an adult telling another adult what, student, what learning is like for kids. It's a flip, right? Like you're, here's the agency. Here's the truth. Here's the voice because they're walking you around the school, talking to you about what it's like, what the good things are, what the bad things are, how they do things. And they can clearly describe what their learning looks like and what their day looks like and what they can see the through line, which mm -hmm. I just find fascinating. I think in deeper learning, the kids see the through line of the learning versus, yeah, I'm learning the quadratic formula. What for? I don't know. I just have to learn the quadratic formula versus they understand the purpose of each day. Right. And I think some language is important here because when you go to schools, they will say that they are student centered. Right. So we're not really talking about student centered education because there isn't an educator alive that wouldn't say she's student centered, but it's still teacher directed. Right. And so I usually use the term student directed or student driven because it shows that that critical shift in agency where the kid is owning more of the learning path and outcomes. Right. We're all student centered. Any of us who in education and care about young people. Right. But that's different from being student driven. We can be student-centered and teacher-directed, and that's what most schools are, but not in these deeper learning places. Yeah, that reminds me of the work of Ben Akalik and Alison Zamuda, and they do, like, they have this whole thing on how there's, like, an arrow, and you have to shift in between the teacher-driven and student-driven and how much agency, and, like, it's a lever at times, right, but really trying to shift that over towards the student agency, and I think student agency is so key to the future of our schools, especially post-COVID. Not that we're over COVID, but there's like the after of the effects of that. And I think students are used to, or at least want more autonomy and choice in school and in their learning. And hopefully our schools will start to piggyback on that. Yeah, I agree with that. And as you know, Dana, it's always a continuum, right? It's always the slider. But I think it's also student agency around something that's meaningful, right? And I think when we talk with a lot of educators, even when they give kids agency, it's agency within carefully defined constructs, right? So like, oh, I'm an elementary teacher and I have centers. So I'm giving my kids agency because they can pick one of these four centers that I created. That's not quite what we're talking about here, right? Because it's agency within a carefully defined space or it's on work that doesn't feel very meaningful to students right? Like here's four different grammar centers, pick your grammar center. And you're like, oh, look, I give my kids agency and choice, right? But it's on agency that's felt as more meaningful and relevant and robust by the kid. And that's why I also, whenever we talk about deeper learning, we also include sort of the cognitive complexity work and the real world authentic lens, because those are things that make that agency more relevant to our young people. So then how do we how might we talk to schools that are getting a lot of pushback right now for students when the curriculum is more open, right? 
because we know that there are some pushback from different states and different politicians and different parent organizations that are saying, we want our kids to learn, you know, what we learned. Don't give them choice. What if they decide they want to explore something that's against my beliefs or is, you know, a different religion or a different whatever, like whatever they were going to explore. How do we, how might we talk to parents and to naysayers to help them understand the need for choice for children? I like to ask parents, what do they think schooling is for? Like, especially up to high school, right? What do you want your kids to be doing at the end of high school? And most of the parents say the same thing. They want them to be courageous and inquisitive. They want them to be ready for college or ready for the workforce or ready to start asking more questions, right? Rarely do they say, I want them to be able to quote in old English, the Canterbury Tales, mm-hmm. right? Which is funny because I had to do that. I can still do some of those verses. I know, Mike, that sounds crazy. It's old English. <laughs> but, you know, parents will predictably say a lot of the same things. Like, give me some words that you want for your kids when they graduate. So when you start showing them the data as far as, and Scott has these data points, as far as these kids get into the colleges, these kids are workforce ready. These kids are ready to pursue a career. These kids are ready to communicate cross-culturally. So those are the kind of skills that we think about when we want to succeed the next step of life. Jason's referencing some of the data, you know, where if you look at colleges and employers, right? Like, do you want another kid who got really great grades by filling out a bunch of low-level worksheets and basically was teacher compliant? Or do you want a kid who maybe got a little bit lower grades, but has just a boatload of hands-on applied experience through capstone experiences, senior projects, service-based learning, you know, internships, whatever, right? And you're going to be hard pressed to find an employer, for example, who doesn't want the latter group, not the former group. I think for me, Dana, I'm thinking a lot about this, is that what you're speaking to is that we don't want to just substitute one size fits all model or another one. And that what you're really speaking to is that we need choices and pathways for kids and families, right? And so if what you want is a very traditional school experience, right, that we should probably have that option for some families. But we also know that that option doesn't meet the needs of everybody. And as I always tell my principal licensure students, if you have a system that takes the incredible diversity of humanity that walks through your doors every day and treats them all to the exact same experience, you're guaranteed to fail, right? So what are the other options we're creating for other kids and other things? And some of those are going to be more deeper learning options where a kid says, I'm not interested in going to college. I don't feel like taking algebra two. What I really want is I want to be a hands-on tree, right? I want to go out and do some, you know, good applied experience out of my community. I want a chance to drive my own learning, so project and inquiry-based spaces or whatever, right? Like we need to create these continuums of pathways and choice options for kids and families rather than just saying that, oh, we're just going to replace the old traditional system with another one-size-fits-all system. Because again, then we're ignoring the diversity of our of the needs of our families. I think that's especially important, especially when we're talking about like international students and international children. In our schools, you know, our kids are coming from such a variety of backgrounds and their interests and what they can bring to the table and to the classroom. Sometimes it's quite unique. You know, I remember talking about, I forget, I think it was, we were doing a a thing on, it wasn't on India, but uh, anyway, and one of the kids was like, oh, I've been there. Oh, I've been there. I've been there. Oh, I went to the museum about this and I learned this, you know, at that location. And so it was just really fascinating to think about the fact that one size fits all isn't going to fit that group and turning it over to the students to be able to share their experiences and things of that nature can really be helpful in those kinds of situations. Awesome. And Dana, I think this kind of work is also, it balances students' interests as well as parent and society comfort levels, right? So when we start seeing some schools having different options for different kinds of kids, like I'm thinking about Kettle Moraine, they have a traditional track, they have a um, health sciences track, a global track, a perform track and a connect track that kids can opt into and parents can support to say, yes, I want to go into health and allied sciences. Great. Let's prepare you for that. Or to say, but I'm not so sure. I'm also really interested in doing a play. Okay. So let's give you some experiences over here, right? That's balancing some of the kids' interests with paths that aren't set out for everyone. The kids can self-select into them and parents can, you know, say, I don't want my kid to do that, but it's giving options and giving kids different chances to explore things that they may not be able to explore um, until 
the real world, if you will, right? Right, and those options and pathways are things that schools have traditionally not been very good at, right? So I think COVID particularly exposed sort of the brittleness or the fragility of our school models is that we were designed for a certain set of things under a certain set of circumstances. And as soon as those weren't in place anymore, like our systems cracked, right? And, and sort of exposed sort of the brokenness or the fragility of, of much of what we created. And that's true for both schools in the States, international schools, whatever, right now. Right. Some schools and families were better resourced than others, so they rode that way easier. But the bottom line is it showed sort of where the sort of the structural limitations were of our current systems, right? And I think yeah. what these deeper learning systems schools do is they create space for differentiation and individualization and personalization within structures that don't break the school, right? So it's not that we have to have 17 different pathways because those seem to be what our kids and families are asking us to provide. What we're doing is we're creating a structured learning space in which every kid can personalize to the degree that he or she needs to, right, within that space. And then you have infinite pathways within a structure that accommodates all of that. So if you want to be on a very traditional path or you want to be in a very divergent path, the school is built from the get-go or designed around that from the beginning, right? And I appreciate how Scott's talking about how COVID showed how broken some of the schools were and how, how they were broken for certain students, right? So in traditional schools, we see some students doing really, really well. And during COVID, they may not have been able to do so well. But yet other kids that were doing horrible in traditional schooling were flourishing during COVID, maybe because they had more choice and voice. Maybe they were able to explore more things on their own because they weren't told what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to take a step back and say, how were these kids flourishing and, and, and what, what circumstances and what did that look like? And then how can we make schools more like that for those kind of kiddos? Right. So the key is your flexibility in terms of accommodating personal differences and directions for kids and families, right? And so we don't satisfy that by just saying like, oh, we're an AP school or oh, we're an IB school, right? Or we're a STEM school or whatever, right? Like, because the key is how you implement within that to create choice and agency and, and directedness for kids and families. Awesome. Well, I was going to ask you what you thought a dream school might look like, but I think you both kind of answered that question, <laughs> which is fantastic because I was hoping to end on something super fun and uplifting. Oh, go ahead, Scott. My dream school is one where kids are excited to show up every day. Right, and where kids are excited to go home at the end of the day at whatever time they're ready for, and you can't stop them sharing about the cool stuff that they did. Right, like I'm tired of the apathy and the boredom and the game playing. Right, and I think for too many of our young people, we're just wasting this incredible potential, like this human capacity to do really interesting work, and we just stifle it in our systems, regardless of whether traditional school, IB school, AP school, deeper, you know, whatever. Right. Like my ideal school is one where pretty much every kid is excited to show up and is excited to tell you all about it at the end of the day, right? And can't wait to go back for more. And we don't have very many schools that can say that. I agree. Mike? No, I just wanted to add another portion to that because you spoke a lot about students, but uh, who is your dream workers who's working at this dream school? Mm. The individuals are there, if you're able to answer that. I think that's a great question, um, especially when we start thinking about the teacher workforce and the stresses that teachers are underneath right now. But what we saw in a lot of the schools that were doing awesome jobs with this, they weren't just all traditionally trained teachers. I mean, they were community members. They were innovators. They were business entrepreneurs. The traditional teachers were there, but they were also teachers that, that were tired of the system not serving all kids, right? They, they wanted a place that had more heart. They wanted a place that had more choice and voice for them too, right? So I think it's going to be teachers who don't want to just focus on the content, but want to focus on the student experience. I think we also saw that for at least some of these schools, they did a really great job of tapping into the community as a whole and recognizing that for a particular learning experience for kids, the ideal facilitator might be a trained licensed educator but it might also be another student. It might be a parent. It might be somebody out in the community who has a particular set of competencies or expertise or experience, right? 
I remember visiting this one school. We didn't profile it in the book, but they had a facilities manager, groundskeeper, who was like this medieval dude. And he was into archery and falconry, <laughs> right? And the school did a great job with their elementary kids, giving them opportunities to learn from this guy, right? Like he wasn't just the groundskeeper. He was also the cool medieval dude. And you could hang out with him as a third grader and, and you know, learn about falcons, <laughs> right? And shoot arrows. And, you know, like that's leaning into your community resources, right? You're figuring out, you know, we've got a parent who's an amazing watercolor artist. Let's bring that parent in to help us illustrate those stories that we just self-wrote, right? For same age peers, right? This is the idea of tapping into who's out there that can help us learn interesting stuff. And some of these schools do a really great job. With that. And Locust Grove did that. Like the teachers could pitch ideas that the kids wanted to learn, like discuss it with like falconry. They didn't have anything that esoteric, which would have been still cool. But, you know, like someone was um, really into guitaring. And like, you didn't bring that into your social studies class. So it's like, hey, I would love to have a guitar club. So they were actually able to bring in their passions into the schools and the kids love that too. So it's like, it's teacher passions too. Yeah. Well, you're both super passionate about all of this, which is fantastic. And thank you for joining us. I know Mike and I were a little nervous because this is our first one and um, the two of you did an amazing job. So thank you very much. And stay tuned to more Ask Me Anythings from ISS EDU Learn. Thank you everyone for tuning in today.